Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Can you all hear me? Yeah. yeah. Oh, good. Um, uh, we're here to discuss a book uh, called Life Under Pressure, as you heard. And I, I wanted to give a one little one minute intro as to how um, I came across this, uh, the, the work of, of Anna and Seth. I was working on a book of my own, and I got curious about um, suicide. And I, uh, I forget which of you I called first. I think it might have been you, Anna. And I had this completely fascinating discussion. And then I called Seth and had an equally fascinating discussion. Then I discovered they were working on a book together. And I said, send me the book. And they did. It wasn't out yet. It was in galley form. And I read it. And you should read it. Um, it is not. It is an academic book that is not an academic book. Um, you don't need to have a PhD to understand it, follow it. It reads. It's. Um, it's an extraordinary, fascinating, um, and disturbing account of. I think I. I read it as a kind of, crit a critique of contemporary American society, um, which is the, the. I know that's the kind of broadest possible reading of what you were doing, but I really thought that it was as. You know, lots of people write critiques of. American society that are up here, and your critique was down here, and that made it much more powerful. But so that's what we want to talk about um, today. And like I said, when you're, uh, when we all finish, I encourage you all to go out and. Um, so I wanted to let's start with the two of you. Um, tell me the story. You, you, you guys, where did you meet? You met at the University of Memphis, is that right? Yeah, we met at the University of Memphis actually, on our first day as faculty, um, at orientation. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we, we uh, met and we had both gotten emails for our orientations and mine was labeled Dr. Aberton and hers was labeled Miss Muller. And so we had a really interesting Went conversation. Over well. <laughs> yeah, we had a great conversation walking to the orientation and I was like, I was angry for her and she was already living. So we kind of bonded over. Well, welcome you know. to Memphis. <laughs> yeah. I was like, this guy's okay. <laughs> he's, yeah. he's not on my behalf. <laughs> now, our... Were you, did you realize from the beginning that you were interested in the same things? Or at the time, were you both interested in the same things? Or did you come, were you coming at this topic that we're going to come at from different directions? Yeah, we were coming at it from really different directions. So, um, so I'm a, a specialist in adolescent development and actually child mental health and thinking about how schools are social contexts that shape kids' you know, lives and well-being and social identities. And, um, and that's a bit different from Seth, but it was pretty synergistic. Yeah, and I was coming at it from a theorist's perspective. So I was just thinking about the general mechanisms and processes behind suicide. I wasn't really... I mean, my feet are always two feet firmly planted in the air. And when we met, you know, we, our partners had moved with us and had very similar sort of tastes and interests. And so we, were, we would drink wine together and hang out and think about what could we do? How could we sort of synergize what we were up to? Were you, Anna, were you, um, uh, were you explicitly interested in suicide in the beginning or something, or much more broadly, children's mental health? More broadly. I mean, in fact, if it, I, my dissertation was looking at like weight um, and like weight loss behaviors among boys and girls in American high schools. So it was pretty different, still really relevant to mental health and well-being. Um, and I've done some other work on, on well-being very broadly. Yeah. 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 So suicide was very new for me. Yeah. So tell me, tell us how the two of you got connected with this place you call Poplar Grove. Yeah, so um, actually I got in a little argument online. Um, <laughs> as one does. Yeah, as one does. It was only Facebook, because it was uh, back in the day. And um, there was, uh, someone had posted a question about essentially suicide contagion, or the fact that after someone has been exposed to a suicide loss, they're um, on average at higher risk of thinking about suicide or even attempting suicide. And so a clinical psychologist, who I now love dearly and is a great colleague and friend of mine, um, she jumped in with an explanation. And I was like, well, actually, it's, it is a little bit more complicated than that, um, because at that point, Seth and I had been working on it for, for like three or four years. And so I offered a more complex explanation of what it was. It's not just pre-existing risk factors. It's a real thing, unfortunately. Um, and, uh, and, so I, and, and she was really interested and was like, wow, can, can I talk to you about this? And um, it turned out that she... Um, grew up in this town that we we call Poplar Grove. It's a pseudonym, a fake name, and um, and then she was like, after talking with me, she was like, "Can you can you talk to my mom?" <laughs> 
And so, um, so then I was like, well, oh, what's the harm in taking a conversation? You know, so I was like, so then I had a conversation with her mom, who was a mental health worker in the community, who really cared passionately about improving suicide prevention. And so then it just kind of went from there. And then I was like, Seth, after, I was just like, we've got, we've got a, this is really an interesting case. After I went and visited and spent two days there just talking with community leaders and, you know, mental health workers, people in the public health department and all of those things. And, um, and I just came home and was like, we got to do this. I don't know what we're doing, but <laughs> we got to figure out how. <laughs> before, before we talk a little bit more about Public Grove, I want to back up. So at the time you had this interaction with the person online who told you about this place called Pop, that you call Public Grove, you guys had been doing work together on suicide. Yes. What was that? What was the nature of the work that you were doing prior to Poplar Grove? Yeah, so it was actually, um, it was twofold. We were doing some quantitative work using existing longitudinal data and some causal modeling strategies. I won't bore you guys with all of the stats, nerd details, although I'm happy to talk afterwards. Um, and uh, so we'd been using that data set to try and um, using social network data to try and unpack, like, when is it that someone experiences vulnerability after exposure to suicide? And is it just exposure to suicidal thoughts? Or is it attempts? Or is it only deaths? Um, and so on and so forth. So we'd been doing mostly quantitative work, and then we'd also been doing some parallel just theoretical work using just, you know, that's more, you can. <laughs> I mean, we were really interested in the fact that people in the media and in the public and even social scientists, psychologists refer to suicide diffusion or the spread of suicide as contagion. And when we hear the word contagion, we think about infectious diseases, like, you know, kids in a dormitory, one gets sick, and then everybody on the floor gets sick. And we were really interested, because no research had been done yet, to sort of tease out why being exposed to suicide affected some people more than others. So we wanted to use this longitudinal data to sort of get at those mechanisms, because it's not exactly like the flu, right? I mean, we're learning from other people, but not everybody that's exposed to it is learning those behaviors and thinking that those are the right behaviors are the, a good choice under certain circumstances. And, and I think in, in unpacking those mechanisms, that's what's going to help you figure out how to stop it, right? Mm -hmm. And so as we were going along, there were some limitations to the quantitative existing data. And so we were getting increasingly frustrated. Um, and, the, and then also realizing that very few people were working on this issue, and yet it can be so devastating for communities to experience a suicide cluster. And so it did kind of sink its teeth into us, and we just got really, you know, kind of focused. And now it's like 13 years later, and we've been working on this topic. So just so, I think this is an important point to kind of underline before we go any, go any further, and that is that when you examine the pattern of suicides among teenagers across a country. What you don't see is simply random scattering. And if it was purely random, you would expect to see some clustering just by chance. Mm -hmm. And what you're saying is that when you look closely at that pattern, there's something more than random scattering. There are, there are patterns the way you would see out outbreak, not patterns statistically the way you might see outbreaks of, dis of contagious disease. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, you do see clustering of suicides in some places, sometimes surprising places, where you really otherwise wouldn't think there would be a high rate of suicide. When you say surprising, what do you mean? I mean, like, look at the state average, right? Like, so this is not a state that's highly impacted by youth suicide, but then we have a community like Poplar Grove in a state that's otherwise not a state we're particularly concerned about. Um, and of course, and, and they're all over the United States. So yes, there is this geographic patterning of suicide that makes us wonder, why is it that some schools, why is it that some communities are disproportionately vulnerable to these, like again, really, really tragic events? Yeah, yeah. So you, the, the, so the, the, you talk to the mother of this person you were talking with online. And one, one additional point before we go on. So that conversation suggests that although you were convinced that there is contagion at work here, not everyone is. Oh, yeah, maybe. I think, you know, so I always try to be really skeptical when I'm starting research. Um, so actually, at the beginning of our research, we, were, we did not take for granted that suicide was a problem in this community. People were saying it was a problem, but one of the first things we did was try to empirically establish 
whether or not it was a problem. Um, to be honest with you, I probably would be equally interested in a place where suicide is not a problem, but people think it is. <laughs> so I was open, to, we were open to these various possibilities. I think for us, that's just good science, is coming in, Not you're not trying to, um, well, you are trying to fact check people. It's not that I don't believe them, but it's just that you have to unpack what people mean sometimes, even by something that can feel really concrete, like suicide. And I think also that there's, you know, there's decades of research suggesting that, you know, exposure to media, uh, celebrity suicides can affect suicide rates, and exposure to friends and family members can also do it. But, I mean, there are skeptics in the scientific community, and there have been skeptics for a long time. I mean, there's anecdotal cases going stretching back centuries of suicide clusters occurring in Rome, or when uh, Gerter published The Life of uh, Werther. Uh, there was a cluster of suicides first in his town among his friends, and then larger and larger until the German authorities sort of banned the book. But there are always sort of skeptics about this. And one of the interesting things is sociologists have not really focused on this. We've really looked at suicide rates when this is truly something that's social. There's something about the environment whether it's a pair of people or a high school or a mental ward, mental health ward or a prison, these tend to cluster in very specific environments and not all of the same ones. Yeah. So you, how long after this conversation do you go to Poplar Grove? I go fast um, because, you know, it's hard to talk about suicide. So when someone invites you in, um, I go as fast as I can. And I, I don't actually remember how fast that response was, um, but I, I think it was within a couple weeks. I, sorry, it was a little while ago. But I do try. I do generally try to go just immediately. And your, did you go with Anna? Did I go the first time? No. I, I, I the we went and started doing interviews together. I think we did focus groups at some point. But yeah. you scouted it out. Yeah. Yeah, that takes a little bit longer because we have to get all the research permissions and the IRB. So. <laughs> The like, you know, the human subjects, like the, the make sure we're doing ethical research and that everybody's being protected how they need to be protected. So that takes a little bit of time, but going out and just having conversations where I'm not collecting data to just see if there's something there, um, that we do pretty quickly. What are your, both of you, tell me your impressions of this town. Well, I mean, there's a there's an interesting story to this. So as, as we were talking about, we started out studying contagion. We're fascinated with how an individual exposed to another person um, catches suicide or, you know, becomes more vulnerable to it. And so we went to this community and we had six focus groups over two days each. And after the first three, we had a break and we had a conversation and we were shocked. Like we had gone there armed with an interview guide specifically for contagion among you know individuals. And what we found was this community that was very tight knit, very well to do, affluent, very homogeneous, very, uh, I mean, people would tell us all the time how much they loved it. The kids would tell us that um, they knew all the adults in their neighborhoods. The, the parents would tell us how they loved the community pool and everybody went there. It was really this great place. Like it was what you hear about in books on, you know, ideal small American towns. And yet they had this massive suicide problem, this enduring suicide problem, this youth suicide problem. And this is, it struck us. We're like, we're asking the wrong questions. This isn't really about contagion per se. This is about a place that has everything going for it and has the suicide problem and isn't throwing its resources at it. And if they are, they're not doing, they're not throwing them in the right places. And so we started really starting to sharpen our questions about, well, what's going on here? If, 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 if I had asked you, before either of you got on the plane for the first time, mm -hmm. to describe what you thought this place would look like, what would you have said? Like, look like or feel like? Feel like. I thought it was going to be really disconnected. I thought it was going to be people don't know each other, people don't care about each other. You know, that sort of thing. That's what, that's what I thought. That's what I assumed. That's what the existing research would have suggested we were going to find. Yeah. Kind of like a bedroom suburb of, like in Memphis, there were several suburbs where, you know, people worked in the city and then they drove home and they parked their cars in their big, you know, McMansions and they didn't know their neighbors very well. And that's kind of what my impression would be of a suburban city like Poplar Grove. Yeah. Yeah. And then you get there and you realize it's the opposite. Yeah, and I instantly actually found it very stressful. <laughs> Why did you find it stressful? I just, it's like, um, you know, so I, I'm really outdoorsy. I love being outside. And if you look at the map, you can see that there's all this beautiful green space, and I could never find it. 
um, like it, it wasn't accessible to an outsider. Yeah. And so there was this very palpable like insider outsider sort of feeling. And I, and, and then it was also, you know, like, um, you know, people are very welcoming. So like when I'm with people that I know there, I feel very welcomed. I feel very comfortable. I'm, I'm always excited and happy to go back now that it's, I, you know, spent four years there and I've continued to go back um, fairly regularly. But, but I worried about like my appearance and like, do I fit in? I mean, for me, you remember talking, I mean, Seth had to talk with me about this because I was like, how do we do field work here? I don't know if I, you know, because when you're doing field work, you are really trying to like fit in. You're trying to move seamlessly um, through a social environment. And for me, it was actually kind of high pressure. Um, I'm a little more laid back than some of the way people present themselves in that community. How did you feel about going? Uh, not as much stress, but I found it fascinating. I mean, there. Were, I was you used felt to some stress, but about something else. About something else. Okay. Well, you we have to clue me in on that. I, I don't remember. Oh, yes, about being Jewish. It, it is very not Jewish of an area, so that definitely was fish out of water. I do remember that. I had forgotten that. Okay. Teamwork. <laughs> but I also found it, like, I guess for me, there was, like, really nowhere. I never felt like there was a place to go. Like, so in every community I lived in, whether they were small or large, there was, like, a downtown or some central space, and there just really wasn't anything like that. So my memories of what we did was, like, going to Dunkin' Donuts and getting coffee in the morning. You eventually found the Starbucks. <laughs> Finding a Starbucks, I guess, yeah. You told me, Seth, when I, one of the times I talked to you, you said... There is no downtown, and so by default, the center of the community is the school, the high school. Yeah, I mean, and from the people yeah, that we spoke with, yeah, yeah, geographically too, and they're like the community center is kind of near, so it did have a very central importance to the way people constructed their identities, what they thought of themselves as Poplar Grovians. It was the core on the weekends, that's where they went for mm -hmm. sporting events. The theater was there, you know, I mean, people could go into the various cities nearby, but I think people lived their lives because they were away during the day, they lived their lives through their kids' sort of realities. Wait, can I, sorry, this question, because as you know, I visited, you know, I went there. No, you I didn't did know not, that? I did not know I you got went so there. curious. <laughs> I totally went there, and everything you the, say is... The, the plot just thickened. It did. <laughs> everything you say is, and I, so I was wondering, if you did not know about this dark dimension to the town, mm. and the two of you were offered a great tenure position at, there's a great school near, not that far away. Mm -hmm. Would right. you, would you, and would you consider, would you live there? <laughs> My wife would have divorced me. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, she, we're, we're kind of bigger city people, so it would have been probably a challenge just on that count. Yeah. But I can see the allure, like I can see as having kids, if you want a good education, it is the best in the state, and it's top notch, and they have all these programs, and they spend lots and lots of money, and you know, on the face of it, it seems like a really safe, calm, cool environment, and the fact that they use their community pools, I mean, there's, those are things that you don't see everywhere in the United States. Yeah, yeah. I, it's I would nice. not. It is very nice. It is very nice, and there were parents who spoke with us, and they were like, how was I supposed to expect this? you know, having, their, having to support their child through suicide loss after suicide loss. And I was like, you know, I, I don't think you can. So, but, the, but that is a little bit of the disturbing thing, right? And, and when I tell you, the people are so kind and so welcoming, and they care about their kids fiercely. That's part of the thing that is just so mind-boggling, right, about this problem. This is not a place where people don't care about each other or about their children. And I think that's what makes it all the more painful that they had to go through this problem yeah. um, for so many years, for over a decade. Um, although, I, I'm, I mean, I'm happy to say that they have been doing a little better on the suicide front, I think, in, in recent years. But after years? Af after, our, yes, after, yes, more than a decade. Yeah. yeah. The, I mean, I want to just break in and say, you, I hope you guys are getting... Uh, a clue as to why anyone who reads this book is so fast. It's a mystery. It's a mystery story. Yeah. It's more than that. It's like a, it's like a horror story, yeah. right? In some ways. I mean, it's really, and the the problem you set up is that a tragedy unfolds in a place that you would never, like honestly, you drive around this town. It is not where where you think tragedy unfolds in America. Nope. So is that like, 
So you come, you both of you go there and discover this place, and you come back. You're at Memphis still. Yep. And you, what's your first conversation about your experience? You come back from the focus groups, and you, you must have sat on the plane together or come back to Memphis, and you said to each other what? I saw, I, I was like Durkheim was wrong. Which, you know, I saw Bernice Pesco Salido and, you know, I was like, who I idolize, who is like, you know, the, I mean, Durkheim is like this very explain, famous. Explain, this is a great way, great. Yeah, I mean, you know, he's, he's one of the foundational scholars of both sociology and suicidology, and he, he had the deep insight that social isolation or living in places that, where there isn't a lot of connectedness surrounding you on a daily basis, giving meaning to your lives, that, that places without that are gonna be places where we encounter suicide, and that was just not what we found. And so, but but he's like the, the bedrock of both sociology and suicidology. And so um, that was mind boggling and exciting scientifically. Yeah, I mean, if, to put it in perspective, he wrote a book in 1897 and sociologists haven't advanced past that. They've been basically <laughs> testing his things over and over. That's, you know, not actually true, but, but it is kind of Bernice true. They do test <laughs> his thesis over and over and there's sort of a, a lay understanding and a soci sociological understanding that connectivity is always good, that integration and solidarity is always good. And what we started to think about is, well, okay, yes, yeah, solidarity is good, connections are good, but we're not asking questions about like the quality of relationships or the content of those relationships, like what's being passed through. So, you know, if you have a family that is really, really integrated, Durkheim would say, this is great but he would reduce it to a statistic so you'd lose sort of the insight into why maybe there's a suicidal problem inside of the family because perhaps it's a, a family that's really abusive, right? Or a family that's like super trapping in the way that people are undifferentiated and stuck inside of it. He, he wouldn't think of that as, I mean, he, I think he would think that was interesting, but he would reduce it to a number and then it would turn into, you know, error. Yeah. In other words, that he was observing the fact of connectedness without without probably properly interrogating the quality of that connectedness. Yeah. And and the and the 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 intentions of it or not the intentions the the implications of it. So what tell me how you came to resolve this mystery. But I don't, I don't want you to give it all away because I want I think yeah. the book is a kind of but I'm just I'm curious in your thought process. You, two of you sit down and say, "So what do we do next? Where if Durkheim's wrong, how do we set out as sociologists to kind of chart a new course. I mean, for me, it's clear. We started with kids. We started with listening to kids and letting them explain to us what their lives were like, what were the things that they were struggling with, um, what were the sources of pain in their lives. Um, and also, um, because we were very interested in the aftermath of suicide, we were also talking to them about grief and grieving and coping with the loss of people that they loved or admired. And so that, that's where we started. And I think in almost all of our work, we actually really try to, to ground ourselves or start with kids' voices. Um, because sometimes they're the, the, the real experts in you know, what is this 21st century and how is it different than when I grew up in the 1990s, that's when I was in high school. And, um, and I think that's just a great, it's a, it's, a fir it's a really solid place to start. And then from there, we started spiraling out, talking to their parents. We tried to interview pairs of kids and their parents so that you could catch the intricacies. And, um, and we talked to mental health workers and, you know, um, pediatricians, psychiatrists, like everybody. But it was kind of like, we were always spiraling, we were always trying to understand why kids were experiencing what they were experiencing. Yeah, and we started asking questions that sociologists, again, had not been asking, or people who were studying clusters hadn't been asking. For instance, why do people die by suicide? Like, it's obvious to ask somebody who's feeling suicidal, why are you feeling suicidal? What's going on? But it's a little bit more interesting to ask a community and people who are really deeply entrenched in that community, why do people die by suicide here? Right, getting at the stories that they're telling inside of the community. And some of this came from just reading more and more research. There are some people uh, in Canada, there are a couple anthropologists who have studied indigenous communities that have suicide rates close to six times the Canadian average. And one paper stuck out to me where you know they were interviewing all these youth and the youth were saying that suicide was about belongingness. That is, they felt so disconnected, so much cultural trauma in their community that to die by suicide, there was this narrative that you would become 
more deeply entrenched in the community. You'd belong. Like there was something belonging about it. And that struck me and, and struck Anna and it made us realize that we're not asking always the right questions here. Why do people die by suicide? Is it ever justified? You know, is it selfish? When is it not selfish? Questions about what, what stories people tell themselves. Did you? Yeah, and we weren't asking like to like ascertain some sort of truth. We were really interested in the stories people were telling themselves along these these lines. How did how did the stories the parents told about their community differ from the stories the kids told? I mean, you know, one sad thing is that actually the parents were pretty clued in to what was going wrong in the community. Um, and what was causing their kids pain. What was actually really difficult for the parents and where the discrepancy was in, was in two things. One was sometimes seeing their own role in um, putting pressure on their kids. And the second was, um, oh, I'm gonna forget it now. I always forget if I do one and two. But it was, uh, <laughs> welcome to my brain. One was good enough, did it function? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, maybe that's it. <laughs> we'll go with that. <laughs> do you have anything to add on that set? Do you remember too? I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> we share Sometimes a Sometimes he does. <laughs> <laughs> Another question I, that comes from that, um, which is, and I only thought, thought of it because I was, I've been doing this strange, weirdly connected thing. Not, well, actually not really. I've been, I met, a, I met the woman that you call if you're the lawyer for a mass murderer. She comes in and your, your, your client's been convicted uh, given the death sentence and you want to mitigate the sentence, okay. there's one person you call. It's this woman. I met her. I was like, whoa, that's your job? She goes, yes. So I've been interviewed. I go and I meet with her every now and again and we, we, I'm collecting tape. And one of the things that's, she's a cl trained clinician. Today, we talked about the difficulty of talking to people who have been traumatized. Oh, yeah. I was just curious. So she's someone who started doing that particular line of work after 25 years as a trained clinician. Mm -hmm. um, you were coming at this, you, you were putting your, your, your toe in some equally, some ways troubled, not equally, but in very troubled waters. Was it hard coming at this without that kind of training and experience? Or what was the... Go ahead. I, was I think without having each other, to be honest, like I think it would have been a little bit more challenging. I mean, there were, we were able to, if one of us was there, we were able to text each other and to have conversations if we had a really hard interview. After every day that we were there together, we would talk, we would debrief, we would drink wine, we would laugh, you know, gallows humor sometimes. But it was, it, it was hard, right? But we had breaks between when we would go there. That kind of helped sort of deal with it. But I think that there was the rewarding piece to it, too. Like, we weren't coming at it as somebody's clinician. We weren't there to try and help them. We just wanted to listen. And people would tell us everything. And they would feel better afterwards more often than not. And that was rewarding, right? And we could walk away from it and say, OK, that was really interesting and really important. And we're going to honor that story. And now let's have some wine, I suppose. <laughs> yeah. I think there was some um, freedom in not being a clinician because, you know, one of the things is that, um, you know, clinical psychology and psychiatry really dominate all of the knowledge production about suicide. Um, and I think that's a mistake because I think we're not going to be able to effectively prevent suicide if we don't consider some of the forces that are beyond that clinical encounter, which is what they inevitably tend to emphasize. We're much more interested in how do we build worlds that are worth living in? How do we build schools that feel healthy and functional and like where places like where kids can thrive? So that was so I think in that sense, us not being clinicians was a gift. Um, I do worry, of course, about keeping people safe and making uh, interviews, um, you know, psychologically safe for people. Mm -hmm. We did have clinicians on call that we could talk to at any time if we had a concern about, um, especially about a kid, but you know, but anybody. Um, we also had tons of local resources that we were constantly sharing with our interviewees. And um, 
And we did actually um, connect one child to care that they very much needed, and we we facilitated that conversation um, in a way that I th I think was was a really powerful intervention into that kid's life. They weren't suicidal, but I just felt like they had so much grief that I I just asked them if I could help them with that. We don't break confidentiality for that, so we won't tell parents for that particular uh, concern. But actually, the kid was really excited and really glad that I would help them. Um, you know, figure out how to access therapy, and, and it ended up, you know, being a really positive experience. So I think it's like you, it's good, but you also have to know your limits and know when to call in a clinician to make sure everybody's. It's a really interesting point about how there are limits to the perspectives that a clinician would bring to that conversation. Can you talk a little bit more? What are they, if they are missing something, what exactly are they missing? I mean, I think when, you know, let's be honest, right? All science, we, we end up asking questions that are relevant to the way we've been trained and to the things that confront us in our faces, right? And so we are sociologists, so it's then not a surprise that we're interested in how the social world shapes individual child development and well-being and ultimately, of course, suicide risk in the case of our, of our work. So I think that clinical psychologists and psychiatrists, they're really interested in, we have a suicidal child in front of us, well, first, or you have a, a, a child in distress, how do we figure out if they are suicidal? Then how do we figure out how likely they are to actually attempt or die? Those are the things that, that therapists like are sort of obligated to figure out, and so that ends up directing a lot of their research, right? Um, so I think that it's, it's, it's sort of inevitable, right? But it is also why I love, and I think Seth loves, like, reading broadly, like we read a huge amount of anthropology, I've read a huge amount of clinical psychology of suicide and, and, and adolescent psychiatry of suicide. Um, so we try to read broadly, but ultimately, I think all disciplines have their bias, and it's only through you know having real interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary conversations that we can actually do the kind of science that's gonna help kids' lives and improve suicide prevention. Mm -hmm. I'll give an anecdote to this, uh, to hammer this home. I w when I first went to UBC uh, in 2017, I think maybe six months into being there, there was a, a cluster that happened on campus. It was kept very quiet. It didn't leak out into the newspapers or anything. And um, the mental health services called me in to, like, with some of the other people in other disciplines. And there was a clinical psychologist there, very famous for what he does. And his solution was to offer, and it was a perfectly acceptable and a really important solution was to offer free counseling and just to advertise that because it was happening in like the fraternities and the sororities and it was being done in a very visible way that it was being repeated and so all these kids were distressed like really distressed and so his solution was to give uh therapy and that was great i i my response was has anybody gone over there and Talk to anybody. Have you gone into the sorority and fraternity and had a conversation about why this is happening, how this is, how they're feeling about this, what they plan to do, like how to like move past this, like how do we do postvention? And you know, they sort of wrote me off on that because it sounded just too big, right? It was a, a, a much bigger project than giving them a phone number. And nothing happened, God forbid, nothing serious that I know of happened since then, but that a sociologist would attack it just differently. You know, we'd mm -hmm. want to know, well, what's happening in these two or three fraternities? Like, and how is everybody reading this and understanding it now? And, you know, how are we keeping them safe? Like, how are we going to fix this? Yeah. I'm reminded, this is a dumb analogy, but I'm a runner and I had a problem with my knee. And I went to an orthopedic surgeon and he's like, yeah, we can go in there and clean it up. Yeah. Then I go to the guy who does his injections. And without even doing anything, he's like, oh, yeah, I can, I can schedule an injection for you. And I went through like yeah. four different, finally I went to a physical therapist who works on the, at the ballet. Mm -hmm. And she said, walk down the aisle, like of her office. She goes, oh, that's what's wrong with you. It's the first time anyone had asked me to, to move. Mm -hmm. And the first time anyone, <laughs> anyone had actually evaluated me as a kind of whole person. Everyone else was focused on the, I went to a foot guy who said it was a foot. Mm -hmm. And the knee guy said it was a knee. Like, it was crazy. But it was exactly what you're... Yeah. Which is, I mean, it's a kind of like... Uh, it's the sort of argument for sociology. Mm -hmm. Right? I mean, an important one. Mm -hmm. That I feel like um, it's not the most fashionable of disciplines at the moment, and maybe it should be, right? <laughs> well, I agree. <laughs> and I think that, you know, one of the things about some of the places where we've worked, they've actually implemented... Um, Poplar Grove a little less so, but we've since, um, 
you know, since the time we did the field work for the book, we've worked in other communities where they have implemented absolutely every single evidence-based suicide prevention intervention that exists. Um, and they were still losing kids to suicide. And so they were like, I guess we'll turn to sociology. No, I'm kidding. Uh, they're lovely, but like, <laughs> what harm can some sociologists do? But you know, they invited us in to try and, you know, yeah. to like have this new, so I do think that, I think there's a very, very strong argument that we need this, right? We need this broader perspective about what kind of lives are we allowing our children to lead and how are we facilitating them getting help when they need it mm. um, so that they don't think that suicide is their only option, right? And so that's, that's really, I would say, if we distill our work down to anything, like that's it. So we, we've teased this long enough and our time is almost up. So we should talk a little bit about um, what, you, what you found and what your sort of diagnosis of what was wrong with Poplar Grove was. Um, do you want, Seth, would you want to give it a kind of? Sure. I'll give it a shot. Um, so we, in essence, we found a place that is not unlike a lot of places. And Anna and I started thinking about an analogy like uh, wet versus dry grass. Like this place was dry grass and it was just required a match, right? The, the loss of a classmate and the place caught fire and they didn't have appropriate water hoses and they didn't have firefighters for this. And you know, the dry grass came simply from the fact that they were putting a lot of pressure on their kids. And like I said, this is like everywhere and not every place turns out the same way because it's not always dry grass. And the pressure was academic. You know, these kids were taking four or five AP classes a semester, their entire year and their entire time there, the athletic pressure, they were expected to be two or three sport players and they weren't just supposed to be the, the teammate, they were supposed to be the captain and they, they were in rock band and they were supposed to do everything, which when I was a kid, right, there was cliques, like the rock band kids were the kids that were over there and like the athletes were over there and like everybody kind of knew what their role was, but here everybody had to do everything and they had to also look like they were doing it without any stress and really easily and, you know, so there was this directive of perfection in, in achievement. And the counter to that directive was a, a negative directive. That was to not look mentally unhealthy, to not look like you're struggling. And so not only were these kids not sleeping a lot, which, you know, is a huge risk factor of suicide and also depression and other mental health problems, but they were under all this pressure. And so failure was this constant specter, this ghost looming behind them. And they always felt like they were failing. Right, Many of them did, especially the really ideal kids did. But there was just this fear that they were going to fail and become homeless. Like automatically, they were going to get a B in a class, and that was it. And so the pressure just was immense. I just laughed a little bit, because Seth and I got plenty of Bs <laughs> throughout our entire academic careers. I got a D in meditation, so. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And to what extent was when you talk to parents, I'm talking, let's just focus on parents for a moment, because yeah. this is the world they chose and constructed, mm -hmm. right, for their kids. To what extent were they aware, at the beginning of your work, when you talked to them, to what extent were they aware that there was something toxic in what they otherwise perceived to be the ideal environment? Oh, I don't think at all. And I think that even, even though they could see their kids were stressed, um, one of the things that hit me the hardest was when parents would say, but this is just what you have to do to get into college. This is just what you have to do to get in, get a merit scholarship to college, right? So to them, it was so normalized to put all this pressure on their kids and to have this kind of narrow vision of what a good kid and a good family and the good life looked like, that it was, um, they just didn't even see the way they were putting pressure on their own children. You know, they were like, I'm not, I mean, literally, we had many parents say to us things like, you know, like it's these other parents who are putting all this pressure on their kids. I mean, my kids need to get good grades, but they know I love them no matter what. And the thing is, is like, no, I'm sorry, that's that's the pressure, right? All parents in the community are are like, I love you no matter what, but you need to get good grades. That's what pressure looks like. And so they were really struggling with, you know, with, with separating that out from just what it takes to make it, you know, in American society in the 21st century, mm -hmm. you know? And then there was a lot of gossip 
that was the other thing that 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 was happening was there was just so much chatter in this community deeply private things would become public knowledge whether it was you know that you dropped out of college or or you know you got you dropped out of whatever grade or ooh, you were in therapy or you were taking um, an antidepressant and and that that really raised the stakes for anybody who wasn't fitting into that you know, very straight and narrow uh, mold, because that that specter of failure was like it was like people will know. Mm-hmm. For an ethnographer, it was incredible. There was this these it was constant sort of contradictions in the way that all of our most of our parents talked. You know, on the one hand, they would tell us about all the strategies that they've employed to like depressure and de-stress their home. And then, you know, and they would blame it on some other parents for like what they do, somebody down the street. And then, out of, you know, 20 minutes later in the interview, they would talk about some of the things that they do. And I would be sitting there thinking about my own kids and being like, that sounds like a lot of pressure in the household. Like you are really not putting into practice. And it's a lot of it, you know, we didn't want to ever blame parents for this because they were stuck in the system, right? They don't determine what colleges demand from uh, high schools or from students, you know, they're, they're just, they move there, they're living in it. They're worried about their kids, you know, success in their future. And they were just, they were on a treadmill, right? And so they, sometimes they could see it. And then other times it was just, they were blocked. Did, Seth, you mentioned your own kids. You, you have two, two. They're, they're both here. <laughs> they're, they're right there. Has this changed not to, not to put, not to blow up your spot here, <laughs> but did wor- did working there change the way you parent? Uh, it it did, and I, I mean I'll give one story. So we moved to Canada, and in Canada, the I guess maybe they follow the best practices for child development. I don't actually You're not understand getting any this. argument for me about <laughs> right. <laughs> so so my my oldest is in second grade, and there was this like month where he had three ice skating field trips, and I found myself looking at my wife Danny. I was like. Do they ever go to school? Do they ever do anything? And she looked at me, she's like, maybe it's just about enjoying school. And maybe it's also about learning to fail and succeed in a different environment other than math and writing and things like that. So she changed my mind. You know, she made me think about it and, and to reflect. Ice fishing? No, just, just uh, ice, skating, ice, ice skating, skating. Ice skating, yeah. So she changed. Either way, it's very <laughs> Canadian. Yeah. Very Canadian, yeah. So she, she changed my perspective, and I thought, you know, it started to make me slow down a little bit and to think about it because it's hard. I mean, even as a parent, I mean, I'm, I grew up in the U.S. for 38 years, and I, I mean, I was just as much inundated by all of this. And I get it. You really worry about your kid's success, and it's really easy to get wrapped up in it. But it, at our school, we don't get a lot of emails. You know, it doesn't feel oppressive compared to my friends who are all in the states, and and all the texts they get from their teachers and their schools, and all the things that they're constantly worrying about. Yeah, we did. This is funny because it brings me back to a um, another one of these I did here a year ago with uh, t- with two women who had written a book about. Um, the problems with girls' sports. Mm-hmm. And it's, what's, what's funny is, I don't know how many, if any of you were at that conversation, which was in many ways not as fascinating as this, but close. <laughs> um, but they were examining a little piece of this, but the things they were saying were exactly the same in the end. Mm-hmm. Like they had very, con- they thought that girls' sports had been ruined by exactly what you're, mm-hmm. they were looking at the kind of Poplar Grove model mm-hmm. and saying, kids aren't enjoying themselves and we're burning them out, and nobody wants to be a coach anymore. And I remember, they had all these things they thought should happen. And one of the first things that was, um, Linda McFarland was, wrote this wonderful book. She was like, parents should be banned from attending their kids' sports. <laughs> it's just not, like, it's just not, no good comes of it. Like, it's just not fun for the kids. It's just the parents are yeah. projecting, it's gotta be theirs, it has to kind of, but they were thinking about this very thing about how do we de-escalate this kind of arms race that's going on in affluent communities. I mean, one of the first shocks that we had in Poplar Grove, and we had a long conversation about this, and it happened independent of each other. We both interviewed a, a, parent, a different parent, and the, the story is that parents put their kids into sports and not usually like the more popular like basketball and stuff because they can't get the scholarships as easily through that because of where the kids are coming from. So they'd put them in these smaller sports like, you know, field hockey or something. And the goal was to get a scholarship so that they didn't have to pay for college. And these families all had the means for it. They had saved Maybe not for college. All, not a all. lot of but them like yeah. they definitely lived in a place where you would assume they've been saving for college and they could definitely send their kids. But the goal was to not 
spend any money on college. It was to get the scholarship. And so the, I mean, it just, again, you think about it, you got to get really good grades, but now you got to go to sports practice and not just one sport, but two or three to hedge your bets. Yeah. Yeah. We should probably take some questions. Um, uh, with the time that we will, and we'll also, we'll, we can go over a little, right? No one's, in, is anyone in any hurry? Yeah. <laughs> I think this is just fascinating. I, so yeah, if you have, um, uh, stand up, state your question loudly and clearly over there. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, we're really lucky to have some wonderful collaborators um, who are or con consultants and who are becoming collaborators who are clinicians. I mean, one, um, so for any therapists in the room, uh, I would definitely, you know, I really like CAMS, um, Collaborative Assessment and Management of Suicidality. It's a therapeutic approach um, that Dr. David Jobes and his team have developed. Um, it's mostly for adults. They're adapting it to teenagers right now. I may not have the, it's, you know, maybe they just published that it's, you know, validated for kids. So I think CAMS is a great tool. Um, there are some other ones that I'm not going to remember their name right now, but I definitely recommend CAMS. Additionally, like there's also some really wonderful clinical psychologists of suicide out there. Um, I mean, you have one of them in New York, Dr. Christine Cha at Columbia, um, Dr. Matt Nock, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, Dr. Matt Nock at Harvard. Definitely recommend reading some of his work, and then. Um, Dr. Rory O'Connor just wrote this really fantastic book for anyone who wants to understand the latest um, research sort of from the kind of clinical perspective on like why people die by suicide. Um, I'm so sorry I'm blanking on the name of that book, but um, it's Dr. Rory O'Connor. So um, I think reading his book along with ours is like really gives you a state of the art picture of, of why people die by suicide. Um, in the second right here. <laughs> She's a plant. Well, I wanted to kind of tee you up. I think part of what makes youth interesting, especially in this specific moment, is the increase in surveillance. Mm. Um, and so I'm thinking a lot about how if you get a bad grade, your parents know immediately, right? So how does that factor into how we think about these communities and that perfectionism for sure? Great question. Mm. Way to ask a hard question, Hillary. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I mean, yeah, no, I mean, it, it's worth thinking about, you know, surveillance. And, and, and I think one of the downsides to surveillance is if we're surveilling our kids all the time, it doesn't give us a lot of opportunity to build trust or their own independence. And especially as kids are in high school and moving towards adulthood, we actually want to be fostering that independence, right? And if we're constantly just monitoring and making sure that things are happening, um, you know, we're sort of destroying their own ability to disclose things voluntarily to us, which then we can react to with grace and acceptance or, you know, a little bit of frustration as the case may be. Um, and I, I think that's that's really unfortunate. Um, I think surveillance does have its place um, because it can, like, you know, Kids are inevitably going to use social media. Um, it's how kids communicate with each other. So I, with my personal friends, I do recommend that they just have a passive monitoring for anything really serious that kids are engaging in in social media, if assuming they can afford it. Um, and that way they get to like kind of have some distance, but if something really serious gets flagged, then they'll be alerted to, like if your kid is um, searching for you know how to die by suicide or something, well, I wanna know that immediately, right? Um, so I think it's important to think about how that undermines our ability to help kids become independent, full selves, and, and build trust in our relationships. And I think one of the great things about growing up in the 90s was like, our parents didn't always know where we were or what we were doing. They and didn't care where we were at times. <laughs> <laughs> I was a child of the 80s, and they just would send you out until our the parents were here. <laughs> but you know. In the 70s, I could tell you it was even worse. <laughs> In, in the back. Um, thank you. I've been a volunteer crisis counselor on 988 and crisis Wonderful. counseling for four years. I first want to validate what you said about kids' stories. When you connect with them and they trust you, they open up deeply. It is, and I've never seen a more articulate group of kids. I, from 12 years old to 20, I wish I could speak that well when I was 
Oh, that, well, first of all, thank you for your work and for anybody in the audience, if you ever have um, someone you love or yourself are in crisis, you can call 988 and get immediately connected to crisis care. And they're wonderful. I've called them myself um, when I had a loved one in crisis and they were offered really amazing support, even to me as like somebody who works in this area. So thank you for giving us an opportunity to just um, share about that. Um, you know, I think that uh, I think what you've touched on is one of the most important aspects of suicide prevention, and it's actually what Seth and I are working on, like right now, um, with our more, most recent project, which is like it's so amazing when kids come forward and call 988 or talk to their parents or talk to a friend or a teacher, anybody, just talk, just reach out when you're in in crisis or in pain. But there are so many kids who don't feel safe doing that, and. Um, so actually, I think that's another argument for why we need sociologists um, helping to build mental health safety nets in schools that kids are willing to use, um, or helping build systems that you know that where kids are actually willing to reach out. We have to think about how do we make it safe for kids to ask for help when they need it, because many kids don't feel safe. So, you know, I. I don't have the perfect answer for you, but I can tell you that one thing we can all do is we can all begin to play our own role. Whenever we're talking to a kid, we can educate ourselves about how to talk about suicide in a, in a non-stigmatizing, accepting, and respectful way. There are lots of trainings. We offer guidance, actually, in the book about trainings that we recommend. Um, and I think that if each of us can find a little way that we can sort of go there for our children in America or wherever you live, um, we'll, we'll be doing a better job. But ultimately, we need a lot more work in this area. Next question. In the front row. Hi. So something I've always loved about your work is something I'm not hearing you today, so I'm hoping <laughs> you can talk about it, which okay. is um, the difference between homogeneous and heterogeneous communities. Um, yeah. Because I think that isn't just from Hopwood Grove, but from your later work, kind of comparing different communities. Did I make that up? That's something I've always thought that, no. that I've derived from. Mm -hmm. No, I think that's that's there's some truth to that for sure. So, for so Poplar Grove is a relatively homogeneous community, and that was part of the story. If you read the book, you'll see that we think that the kids there we, we used to call it kind of like a fishbowl. They were sort of stuck in a world where all the kids around them, or most of the kids around them, they could identify really easily with. So whatever behaviors influential kids were doing, whether they were high status kids or just close friends made sense. And so if a classmate lost their lives, they could make sense of their own problems by just understanding the people around them. And so one of the things that we've talked about, and we haven't really explored it in depth empirically, is the idea that introducing some diversity, some heterogeneity into a place where there's a, too much homogeneity could start to be a piece of breaking the cluster, right? Could dissolve it. Because when you go to a big urban school, for instance, right, everybody has a clique. There's alternative sort of systems to like occupy. And while that increases the hierarchy oftentimes and increases things like bullying in certain ways, it does actually allow kids to find their home, right? To find, like, whereas in Poplar Grove, we just didn't see that. We saw kids who, we called them the cultural rebels. They knew things were bad and that they wanted to leave, but they also would say things like, I just don't know what it's like outside of here. You know, is it different? Are kids under less stress? And so they couldn't really escape that sort of homogeneity. I think one of the things we know about, about people and psychological well-being is that feeling like you don't belong, feeling like you don't fit in is incredibly painful. So when you're in a place where it has a really narrow view of, of what it means to be a good person, a good kid, or whatever, um, you're just, for those who don't meet that mold, it's incredibly painful. Um, so if you have more heterogeneity, and, it, and we're not just talking about race and ethnicity or religion, um, it could be, I mean, it could just be, in, in a million different ways, right? Um, but diversity, um, having kids go to school with a bunch of people whose lives are fundamentally different than their own, it can help them see other ways to be in this world. Um, and that can be a real powerful uh, you know, source of, of resilience for kids as they are striving to figure out who they are and how they want to move through this world. You know what's interesting about that is I feel like sometimes our discussion of the value of diversity is impoverished. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
that we think is just about feeling good or running past wrongs, and we're not stressing that there are a whole range of, of, of kind of positive outcomes that come from being associated with people who are different from yourself. But anyway, um, we have time for just a couple more questions. Good ones only. If you don't have a good question, <laughs> lower your hand. Just a little um, bit of pressure. Right there. <laughs> Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. So without going too much into the, I think this is on page 172. <laughs> <laughs> but without going into too much, this is our point. But just yeah. to say, like, I guess what I wanted to think about together was um, anger, mm. um, if we could a little bit, and yeah. how postvention really is prevention, mm -hmm. I think, right? Is this a fair? Yes, yes, and, absolutely. Um, and one of the reasons why we need sociologists, because if there's anyone who knows anything, and I'm, I'm a philosopher, by the way, mm -hmm. not a sociologist, but That's very. That's a very interesting um, question. So Luke was somebody who was very angry. Not only that his friend had died by suicide, he was just furious with her. Um, but he was also actually, if I'm remembering right, very, very. You did this interview. Very, very angry at how other people were sort of picking up her story and just running with it. And it's kind of, he felt like they were performing grief rather than actually grieving. And, you know, some difficult thing, and I'll also just add that one of, I think, the most powerful moments in our interviews with people who were grieving was telling them that actually being angry, they were very ashamed of being angry, and telling them that actually a lot of people are angry, and it's okay to be angry, and we don't mind talking about how angry they were at the person they had loved who had died by suicide. And that was incredibly powerful. Like, they almost always were like, wow, you don't know what a weight you lifted off my shoulder. Um, so I think that you know the the problem with memorialization is that we absolutely have to collectively grieve because that's as a society that's the only way to heal right is to acknowledge a loss that we've had and and to come to terms with it through collective um, you know memorialization but at the same time kids experience painful things through these massive memorials that um, that Poplar Grove had, where thousands of people would come to these memorial services. We never went, because we did not feel that was appropriate, and I stand by that decision easily. Um, so I can't say with, with that firsthand account, but, you know, um, and it's, it's very difficult because the family has one set of needs that we really have to honor and that they have like the real right to honor. But it's also really important sometimes for other organizations to come in and play a role in helping um, other kids, you know, get those sort of emotions met, hopefully talk to them about the fact that being angry is okay. Sometimes also helping them understand that we don't understand why, we don't always understand the grief that we are observing in somebody. They could have, I know with one kid we interviewed, they had just lost a family member to suicide. And so when a classmate died by suicide, that was really hard for them because their grief was getting mixed up, right? We don't always know people's stories. You also don't know who just said something super kind to them in fifth grade that stuck with them for years. We don't know people's stories. So, you know, that was the hardest chapter for us to write. It was the last one we wrote. And it was very, it was very difficult in part because it's hard 
hard to have perfect sound bites. So we rather just tried to leave people with some understanding of like what it's like to go through this as a kid, as a family, and, and some avenues forward, um, really emphasizing how important it is to memorialize um, and, and the, the, the counter is that people are afraid that large memorials will trigger suicide contagion or a suicide cluster, which I can't say that, I can't say it's not a concern, right? But we still have to grieve. I would not okay with us not grieving. And, and you know, for analytic reasons, we separated the sort of school response, the postvention from the memorialization. But a lot of times I think of these things as so deeply connected. And one of the things that this community didn't have was, you know, a really effective postvention response. And like one of the things we would always advocate Which for any school. You just explain postvention. So so after in the event that you a classmate is, dies by suicide, uh, postvention is the, the all of the trauma response, the crisis response, the plan that the school has in place to just take care of people to take care in of the kids. aftermath. Right? Do and they have enough prevent more suicides? Right? Do they have enough crisis counselors? Like, where where are the spaces for kids who are crying? Where are the spaces for kids who are angry? Like, where what are they doing with the kids? And so it's a very immediate thing versus the memorialization, which happens, you know, any anywhere between a week or a little bit longer afterwards, depending on the process. And you know, we always advocate that a school have a postvention plan in place that it really think seriously that it gets the best evidence-based stuff that's out there. And there's not a perfect plan, but just knowing that they have to erect these sort of safety nets and to take care of all the kids and to know that grief is different. For some kids, it's going to be anger. For some kids, it's going to be sadness. For some, it's going to be shame and guilt. And just working through that, we think that that is such a huge piece, and that ends up either exacerbating the memorialization part or potentially helping protect against some of the effects that that might have. One last question, and then we will call it an evening. Um, over there on the... Go for it, yeah. So I, I understand and appreciate, like, if with limited resources, should we focus on homes or should we focus on schools? But the problem is, is that both of those are so fundamentally critical to psychological pain and suicide prevention. If a kid is experiencing intense pain in one of those places, first we better hope that the other place is really, really positive to, to be a source of resilience. But it's absolutely fundamental for our society to be helping families take care of their kids, um, regardless of resource scarcity. Um, and it's absolutely essential that we equip schools and make them ready to um, engage in meaningful suicide prevention and postvention. I would also add our healthcare, both mental and physical healthcare, also have to play their role. And with those three domains, there's no getting around it. All three of those places, um, instead of kind of focusing on what what you talked what you the way you posed the question what Seth and I have been saying is like okay let's assume we're not going to get any more school funding although I'm also the first to be like school funding is suicide prevention um, we should fund schools better for a lot of reasons how do we use school how do we use what schools have efficiently and effectively and equitably so that we can do a better job of this for the kids who are having an easier time coping in Poplar Grove, they often had a parent or a mentor that wasn't always a parent who really helped them navigate the complicated social context. Those were the kids that were able to find some resilience in the face of this you know, high pressure high school. Um, so families absolutely play, and we have um, 
you know, some important sections of our book where we talk, really talk about the role of families. We also, you know, the other thing that families can do very powerfully is role model, that it's okay to live with a mental illness. <laughs> it's okay to go to therapy. Seth and I both do. <laughs> and we, we admit it all the time, any, any chance we can, because we have to normalize that it's okay to get help. It's okay to experience psychological pain. Um, I also hope that our therapists can get a little bit better at, at being okay having clients with suicidal thoughts because a lot of therapists like really really don't like it when um, when they have a client with suicidal thoughts and like well that that's really unfortunate um, so yeah so I don't know if that fully answers it but that's the best I can do <laughs> with limited time resources. <laughs> Seth, do you want to say anything? I'm, I'll just reinforce this I'll just say that in in the three different communities that we've been in now listening to kids talking to teachers and staff and parents uh, it just feels like the plot has been lost in the sense that they're just kids and for Poplar Grove it was you know turning them into adults without any playtime and free time and like they were just supposed to be like you know militarized and like sent off into college in other places it's not necessarily that it's more you know combatant um like who belongs who doesn't belong like what is the school about like where sh who should be going where and what should people people be doing and i think we just keep forgetting that they're just kids and they just aren't fully formed humans and these are important moments. We should just be taking care of them, right? So our big thing is we should just create really safe, healthy safety nets that are designed. We're not going to catch every kid. We know that we're not going to catch every kid. Not every kid's going to tell us, uh, but we can reduce it if we just make their lives happier, right? And in the school is where we're mainly working because it's harder to get into families. It's harder to get into a household and watch and enough of them and do that research. So we're looking at schools and thinking, well, how do teachers, how can teachers just fold this into their daily routines in a way that's not an extra burden, right? And they can just do that kind of work. And it doesn't have to be stopping a crisis. It could just be sitting in the hallway, seeing a bunch of kids and saying, hey, it's good to see you today, right? Just noticing kids every single day. That's not going to stop it all. But if the system, right, the ecosystem, as you described it, begins to think of itself as an ecosystem and is reflective, then it maybe will help stop a few. I want to... Thank the two of you, and I wanted to um, say, first of all, there were there were two moments in our conversation that have stayed with me. One was when you were saying, Anna, when you first heard about it, and I said, well, how long before you went to visit Poplar Grove? And you said, essentially, I went as soon as I could. Mm -hmm. And that you didn't know what you were going to find, but you went to listen to people. Mm -hmm. And then when you said, Seth, that there was a problem on the campus and, and the, that you're working at now, and you ask the question, well, has anyone gone and talked to the kids? That, and it reminded me that this is really a book fundamentally about listening to people, mm -hmm. right? It's a, it's a book that's composed of people's voices. And one of the reasons I highlight that is that I, I feel like we're at a certain moment in our culture where we're not, we're not good at that. Mm -hmm. And it's not our first impulse when we're confronted with a problem is to go and listen to people. Um, and that, that, for that reason, you know, there are a million reasons to love this book and read this book. That, to me, is at the top of the, at the, top of the list. It's, that, it's a, 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 a reminder, a very powerful reminder of the value of that kind of, of, of generous, open-minded listening. Um, anyway, so my hat is off to both of you. Thank you so much for giving us this wonderful book. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.